Okay, we're going to start with the uh, with the class today. Uh, today is May the first, twenty twenty two. I'm going to be continuing with the uh, study of the book of Daniel. Today is going to be Daniel chapter four, verses from nineteen to twenty seven. This is start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for a wonderful day today. It's the first of the month. Uh, give us the, uh, the inspiration, give us your wisdom, and give us the ability to uh, study your word, and uh, give us the strength to apply what we do learn in our daily lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, we're going to start reading the verses from 19 to 27. Hmm. The title of the lesson is Daniel Interprets the Dream. And it starts at verse 19. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with stop touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals, and having nesting places in its branches for the birds. Your Majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky, and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. Your Majesty saw a holy one, a messenger, coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump, bound with iron and bronze, in the grass of the field, while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation, your majesty. And this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be then your prosperity will continue. Amen. Okay. start verse 19. Uh, it says, Then Daniel, also called Betachazar, was greatly perplexed at the time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Betachazar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Betachazar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. Well, the, last week we, uh, we studied that uh, the Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, another one of his dreams. And he also called the uh, magicians and the uh, soothsayers and, uh, and the wise men. And they all uh, still could not uh, interpret the dream, even though he told them the dream, as opposed to the first dream when he didn't tell them. So he told them the dream, the dream and uh, he just, they just couldn't interpret it. So he calls Daniel. Daniel sees the dream and he was alarmed and uh, because he knows he knew the significance of the dream and that he was reluctant to tell uh, the significance to, uh, to, to the king, Nebuchadnezzar. So Daniel was greatly perplexed, not because the dream was unintelligible to him, but because of his reluctance to announce God's judgment to the king, who apparently had grown to love <clears throat> and respect. Having come to understanding of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel was so upset by his content that he hesitated to divulge his meaning. And his thoughts terrify him, because he foresaw such tragic things coming upon the king. And he was afraid to declare them, these things coming upon him which he acted by a spirit of prophecy, double his condemnation and trouble his thoughts. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. The, dream tried to, the king tried to encourage Daniel to be truthful by saying, speak out freely, let the event be what it will. 
But the Chancellor answered, My lord, is only the dream applied to your enemies? An ominous note is sounded by the wishing of the dream on the enemies of the king. Daniel wishes that the awful message of judgment were somehow intended for the king's enemies and not the king. Though the king were a tyrant and an enemy of God and his people, yet the prophet is grieved for him and pray for him that God will avert his judgment from him and lay them rather upon his enemy. So uh, by looking at the dream and uh, knowing the significance of the dream, Daniel was so alarmed that he didn't want to tell the, the king right away and uh, he wishes that uh, the significance of the dream will apply to the enemies, not to the king. Uh, so let's go continue verse 20 and 21. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the white animals, and having nesting place in its branches for the birds. Now, in the Old Testament, a tree is a common symbol for a ruler. Since few trees were present in Babylon, a tree of the gigantic proportions described here would have been impressive and unique. And it continues, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit. Daniel indicates that the Nebuchadnezzar was a source of abundant blessing for all. The beast and the birds represent the happy citizens of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. In these two verses, Daniel refers to the circumstances uh, concerning the tree, as it appeared in the dream, without any reference yet to the order to cut it down. It was important to this kind of narrative to show clearly they referred to the king, a fact that probably Nebuchadnezzar himself already perceived. But still, it was important that this should be so firmly fixed in his mind so that he would not be completely surprised when Daniel would disclose the reminder of the dream. So the tree is the king, the branches the princes, the leaves the soldiers, the fruits the revenues, the shadow the protection afforded to dependent states. Okay, so that's the uh, significance of the uh, main characters of this dream. So let's go to verse 22. Just in time, gentlemen. We are on the second page, third page. Verse 22. Could you please uh, read? Your Majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky. And your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. Okay, so in the last, uh, like I was saying before, last week the king had that one, another one of his dreams. He dreamt of a big tree, you know, so tall that it gave all the branches and leaves and all that. And uh, his uh, wise men could not interpret the dream, so he calls Daniel. And Daniel sees the dream and sees the interpretation. I was scared to, uh, to tell him that the tree, you know, and uh, what well, the significance of the tree. And uh, of course, in the Old Testament, a tree signified the ruler. So the tree starts being at it, but then it becomes a him. So, verse 22, it says, uh, Your Majesty, finally, he said, You are that tree. You have become great and strong. Daniel here referring to the limited extent of the king's dominion when he came to the throne and the increase of his power by wise administration and by con conquest. While he could speak of greatness, strength, and dominion, Daniel tempered the fearful impact of his message. And he continues, your greatness has grown. The majesty and glory of the monarch had increased by all his conquest and by the magnificence which he had drawn around his court. Then he talks about the sky and the earth. You know, the tree touches the sky and it's all over the earth. These terms convey the idea of totality. Using deliberate exaggeration, Daniel says that Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom extended from the sky to the ends of the earth, and so was universal. Nebuchadnezzar's empire was the largest and most powerful in that part of the world at that time, up to that time. Okay, let's continue verse 23. Uh, Romeo? Your Majesty saw a pomegranate, the messenger, coming down from heaven, saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, for leave the stump only bearing the thorns in the grass of the field, where its roots remain in the ground. Let him be blessed with the dew of heaven, let him be with the wild animals, until seven times pass by for him. 
Okay, so he sees a tree, and then he sees a messenger or an angel giving orders. Okay, so the majesty saw a holy one, a messenger. The recapitulation of this verse is uh, a little different from the statement in Daniel 13, 16. A messenger means a waking one, one who is constantly alert. The words holy one suggests that the watcher is either the Lord himself or one of his angels. Then the messenger says, cut down the tree and destroy it. The idea here is that the tree was to be utterly cut down and all its glory and beauty destroyed. It was first to be cut down, then its limbs chopped off, and then there was to be a strip of the foliage, and then the fruit which it bore to be scattered. But leave the stump, you know, the base of the tree. Leave the stump. The destruction of the tree, however, was not to be total. The stump is to be left, which might ultimately grow again. Bound with iron and bronze, they put these chains around it, either for restraint, as for a madman, or for preservation to present to prevent the trump as being dug up. After the tree had been cut down, the stump is to be preserved and protected, secured by a hoop of brass and iron, from being split by the sun's heat in the hope of its growing again. Then he says in the tree would, was to be laid in the grass of the field, but its roots remain on the ground. There will be nothing remarkable in the tree surrounded by grass. The tree, it is evident, must symbolize something else. And its true significance is when it applies to a person. And then the next verse says, Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, not let it, let him. So at this point it becomes obvious that the tree is being referred as him, is a symbol of a person. So the tree is here personified and later identified like the king himself. And he says, Let him live with the wild animals. Let him be, be deprived of the use of reason and have no more ability than animal has. Let him be wholly governed by the animal senses and behave and act as a beast does. Be as senseless and savage as that. Until seven times pass by for him. The word times can refer to indefinite periods. It could be referred to years, months, weeks, days, or hours. Most take it to be years, to mean years, based on the usage of times elsewhere in the book of Daniel. Seven is a biblical number for completeness. And he says, uh, let me live seven years as a beast in, in a man's shape, among beasts of the field. Let him become brutish, without human sense and understanding, and disappear much also in his shape, outward shape, like a nails will grow like claws, and hair like a uh, feather. You know, sometimes when you don't cut your nails, it will keep growing. There was a man in India who did not, did, decided to grow his nails for 15 years. Mm -hmm. So the nails were like, like this, like that, all the nails. So he can be in the, in the Guinness Book of Records mm -hmm. as a man who had the longest nails. So they were measured all the nails. After they measured, they cut it down. I mean, I, I mean what was his life on the, every day? I mean, he couldn't do anything. He couldn't type, forget it, couldn't eat. Okay. So he says, continue. So the warning begins to make the interpretation plain. The tree stump is human yet destined to revert to an animal existence. What about do with the, like the grass, which he shares with the beast? Indeed, he exchanges human mind or intelligence for that of the beast, but for a limited period, for seven years. Now, the significance of the dream is that, that this, if he refers to a person, this person is going to lose his mind and is going to become like an animal for a period of time. So let's go to verse 24. Nico? This is the interpretation of your majesty and this is the decree the most high the most high has issued against my lord the king so the decree has passed concerning him and will be most certainly fulfilled and because of the certainty of it it will be represented very plainly for it would surely and in short time come upon him exactly as he was determined in the dream Daniel here directs the attention to the, mon the monarch to the one living and true God, and shows him that he presides over all. The purpose of the vision was, in the most impressive way, to convince the king of God's existence and sovereignty. Hence, Daniel says that all this was in accordance with his decree. It was not a chance, you know, a thing of chance. It was not ordered by idol uh, gods. It was not an event that occurred by the mere force of circumstances. It was a result of the operation of secondary laws. It was a direct divine intervention. 
the solemn purpose of the living God that should be so. Daniel informs the king with the greatest tenderness and most respectful terms of the sad reverse of condition that was going to happen to him. So the next verse is the key of the whole thing. Uh, Romeo, verse 25. Will you be driving away from people and will you leave, will you leave with the weird animals? Will you eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven? Seven times we pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. So here, finally, the Daniel tells the king, this is what's going to happen to you, okay? You, you're going to lose your mind, <laughs> you know? And he says, uh, he starts the, the verse by saying, you will be driven away from people. And this will be done not by his family, his wife and children, or by his nobles, who are afterwards said to seek him, but the most high God, and to show his power over him. And it might be by means of his ministering angels, or he was driven by his own inclination, an imagination, which was directed by God to prevail over him, judging himself not a man but a beast. And so it was most gratifying for the king to live with beasts than with men. What I'm saying is that the, the, the king is going to lose his mind. Okay? He's going to lose his mind in such a way that uh, he thinks to be an animal. So he start walking on the, on the grass and start eating grass. That's the animals. Because he wants to do. And they offer him all kinds of food. No, he wants to live an animal. But he not lost his mind completely. He still has resembled some mind. So even though he's living like an animal, he still has some control of his mind. So totally he's not uh, out of his mind. The meaning seems to be that Nebuchadnezzar should be punished with insanity, which would deprave his imagination, but will still remain his memory, and perhaps his reason in some intervals, and that he will believe himself to be a beast, and live as such, and see hard to be change from that of a man to a beast. And then he will live with the wild animals. You know, there are some people do that. And his dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, in the open air, or in some den and cavern, instead of being in his court among his nobles. A strange change of condition indeed. And then you will eat grass like at the ox. And the king will eat grass and oxen, as oxen. Imagining himself to be a beast, he will choose this sort of food and eat it and feed upon it with pleasure. And besides having no other food, he will be forced to eat this, as well as his generate and depraved imagination will direct him to do it. The affliction of Nebuchadnezzar is known technically as a wantrophy, or wantrophy, however you want to pronounce that. That is a mind acting like a name. So it's a, it's, a, it's a sickness. It's a disease well attested to in historical and scientific literature. However, many critics view this account as a fable or tale without historical substances. Nothing is known of this malady of Nebuchadnezzar apart from the account in the book of Daniel. It is important to remember, however, that there is virtually no information about the reign of Nebuchadnezzar from 594 to 562 BC, which was the year of his death. His madness could easily have fallen within this period. And be drenched with the dew of heaven, he will be stripped of his clothes and be naked, so he should have nothing to shelter him from the dew and rain and be exposed to the elements. Seven times will pass by for you until acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign. He will soon learn the lesson. So they're going to let, God is going to let this man uh, lose his mind, live among animals for seven years, but he's not going to lose his mind totally. And he eventually he will acknowledge that uh, God is a, you know, is the only God to be uh, worshipped. It appears from it that uh, that this judgment was inflicted on the on, a, on account of his pride and arrogance, and he's making no acknowledgement of a divine providence, ordering and governing the affairs of the world, by attributing the acquisition of all his great power and vast dominion to his own abilities, instead of acknowledging it as the gift of the Most High God. Verse 26. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its root means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Okay, this verse 26 starts by saying, the command to leave the stump 
of the tree with its roots means that the kingdom will be restored to you. There shall be no other king chosen during this affliction, but you shall again receive your kingly power and reign as before. So when he lost his mind, his kingdom will be protected. Nobody's going to usurp the kingdom. Nobody's going to take over. So that is going to remain as it is, waiting for him. That is, you shall not die under this calamity. But after he had passed away, you shall be restored to authority. It might have been supposed that this meant that the authority would survive in his family, and that those who were to succeed him would reign as shoots spring up after the parent tree has fallen, like a branches of the tree. When no acknowledge that heaven rules or that God rules, this was a great lesson which the event was designed to teach. And when that lesson has been learned, then the king should be restored to his throne and should proclaim this to the world. Heaven is a synonym, as a synonym for God is unknown elsewhere in the Old Testament, though it is found in the books of the Maccabees. In the New Testament, most obviously, in the phrase kingdom of heaven, Matthew's counterpart to kingdom of God in the other synop synoptic gospels. Ultimately, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom is the kingdom of God. And the king has only to acknowledge that fact to regain his sanity and his throne. So it would appear that he is, after all, in control of his fate. As metal dance protect the tree, his stump, so the throne or the king would remain undisturbed and safe for him once he knew that heaven rules. Okay, and the last verse of this lesson is verse 27. Romeo? Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to access my eyes. Your knowledge your sins by doing what is right, and your wickedness by being kind to your friends. It might be that then your prosperity would continue. Okay, so after he tells the, uh, the dream or the interpretation of the dream to the kingdom of Ganassar, Daniel says to him, This is what's going to happen to you unless you change your ways. If you change your ways, there might be a contingency plan there. Probably this is not going to happen. But you got to change your ways. It's like a repentance, you know, it's like a sin. If you don't accept Christ and you continue, you're going to go into destruction. But you got to change your ways. You cannot only confess Christ, but your life has to change. Okay? So it starts by saying, Your Majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Daniel exhorts the king to avert the tragedy by acting immediately on his advice. And here, he resembles the classical prophets like Amos 5.15, in that there is a contingent element in his prophecy. These words, Daniel adds out of love and respect for the king. If perhaps his complying with the advice might turn away uh, this dreadful faith from him, or at least might give the king some hopes of a mitigation of a calamity. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness. Here the writer urges an incentive to a change of lifestyle. It is not by good deeds the king can save himself, but by changing his way of life, the king may be demonstrated his acceptance of the truth of Daniel's words. By being kind to the oppressed, this is one of the uh, uh, caution phrases that uh, Daniel is telling him. Cease to do evil and learn to do well. Change your principles and practices. Do justly and love mercy. And instead of oppressing the poor, have compassion upon them and be kind and bountiful to them. Give evidence of true repentance and reformation. This draws attention to injustices. Uh, in the state in which it was the king's power to put it right. I mean, he had the power to do it. Exactly what ideals the Babylonian king would have had, we cannot know. But evidently, it took more than warning and exhortation to move him to action. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. After interpreting the dream, Daniel counseled the king to abandon his despotic ways and acknowledge the rule of God so that he may become, by his reformation, more capable of pardon and prepare for it. Daniel was not certain of pardon for him, nor did he altogether despair of it. The words of Daniel were spoken with wisdom and tenderness, and yet they were very plain, with great plainness. Okay, so we have here the interpretation of the dream. We, last week, the king had a dream, calls Daniel, Daniel in interprets the dream. It's very plain. You know, this is what happened to you. And if you don't do it, you're going to live like an animal for seven years. But if you change your ways, 
maybe this is not going to happen. Now, in the next chapter, you know, we're going to see what, what happens. But this is the end of uh, the interpretation of the second dream. Do you have any questions? Any comments? Anything to add to it? Well, it's, it's kind of a, I mean, like a very good story for... Uh, it's straightforward. Yeah. Now, uh, I must say, this second dream happened about 30 years after the first dream. So the Daniel must have been here about 46, 48 years mm. when he turned the second dream. Okay? So just keep that in mind. All right? He's, you know, he's getting older by the week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was going to say, like, it's a good story, like, to, uh, you know, to spread the gospel. Sure. I, I remember when I was a kid, we had, like, an, um, an Adventist. They were Adventists. They were our neighbor. And they organized, like, they, they were trying to, to, you know, to, to spread the gospel, and, and they made like a big screen. Really? And they, they called all the kids, and they shared the story of Daniel. And I remember they talked about this, the, this dream, and, and I didn't know anything about mm -hmm. the Bible, Bible at that time, but they were just there, and they shared the story. Um, um, it was this story, like, the king had a dream, and... And Daniel interpreted it. It means that he was going to be destroyed. But Daniel had uh, an advice for him. And he said, if you change your ways, uh, this is not going to happen to you. And the, the, the woman said, and it's it's the same for our life. If we don't change That's right. um, these things that happen to the king, is going to happen to us too. So you need to change your ways. And that, yeah. like, God is not knocking on your door. Way. He said, if, if you continue sinning, it's going to lead you to destruction. Yeah. But you can change it. Yeah. You know, it's up to you. You know, you have to take initiative. Yeah. Okay. So that, that was really great. Reminds you. Very nice people. Very well. Excellent. Okay, anything else? Yeah. Nope. Okay, let me let me finish this thing here. Put this finish. <laughs>